Welcome back to those of you who are joining us online. It is such a pleasure to be back here for the rest of the afternoon with you all. There is no doubt that in our day and age, we face all sorts of vain philosophies and empty deceits and all sorts of competing ideas that are swirling all around us all the time. So the question is, how can we as Christians combat this deceit and these philosophies and these worldly ideas that are always swirling about? Dr. Nichols is going to join us again to address this very question. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. Stephen Nichols. Thanks, Stephen. Well, when I woke up this morning, I had no idea what was in store for me today. And, and I had what is easily a first-time experience. And to make sure I got this right, I confirmed with my, the hippest person I know, Eric Bancroft, that I was ollied over. But not once. I was ollied over twice with, with you right there by my side. So it was a very exhilarating experience. If you didn't see it, I was on a, a longboard looking up at the sky, seeing what would be the last thing I would see before I exit this world. And it was delightful. My teenage years coincided with, I'm sorry, but what was the best decade of all time? The 80s. So, I just for those of you that didn't experience it, and I feel so bad for you, I just want to share a few 80s sayings. Totally awesome. As in, being ollied over is totally awesome. Gag me with a spoon. This is a word that I think Pastor Bancroft still uses. Gnarly. Not to be outdone by rad. But even better than some 80s expressions are some famous 80s movie lines. I am your father, Luke. E.T. phone home, go ahead, make my day. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Some of you will get this one. Some of you will be like, what is he saying? Nobody puts baby in a corner. And then last, I'll be back. So, those of you that missed the 80s, a little taste. Sorry, wish you could have experienced the whole thing. I've been looking into some 2020s sayings. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to make an absolute fool out of myself, but here goes. <laughs> Bussin'. Slay. <laughs> Pastor Bancroft taught me this one. Cray cray. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Bingham and I always share this expression with each other. Spill the tea, sis. <laughs> I may or may not have a job come Monday. I don't know. <laughs> but how about these expressions? We'll go from the uh, humorous to the insidious. Love is love. Or, every time I hear this, it is, it is like the fingernails on the chalkboard. Your truth. Or here's one. You... Be you. Uh, that's the one I want to think about for a while with you. 
Uh, but to think about that one, I'm going to go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Because behind all of those, love is love. Your truth. You be you. Uh, behind all of those is a world view. And, and I'd take a step even further and say, actually behind those is a program. Uh, almost a machine that is pushing upon you a, a point of view. As you're finding Colossians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, <coughs> and as you think about these verses, especially verse 8, think about, though it is the first century, where we are in the 21st century, we're still facing similar things. Paul says to this church at Colossae, see to it that no one takes you captive. First of all, you got to see the, the word choice there. This is serious business. Uh, there's, there's an agenda here. Uh, this is not something that's, that's sort of a luxury to be thinking about. Uh, there's an urgency here. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, uh, by empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits, or another way we could, could translate that would be basic principles. The basic principles are the elemental spirits of the world. Uh, there were all of these in the first century. There were philosophies, there were worldviews, there were human traditions, there were sort of basic principles. Uh, they looked a little bit different from those that are circulating in our day. Uh, significantly, it had to do with, with, with being. And there was a philosophy out there that said, you are an immaterial being only. Uh, the body is, is an illusion. Real existence is beyond the physical, and in fact, all matter is, is bad. Uh, the body is just a tomb, and you need to get to the afterlife to escape it. And there were pure immaterialists. On the other side of the coin, there were pure materialists, that all that exists is matter. To come back to an 80s song, everyone is a material girl living in a material world. And you're either a material, all matter, and there's no afterlife, and there's no world to come, and there's no spirit, there's just this world. You live in it as, as what the philosophy that came out of this, as hedonism, the, the wholesale pursuit of pleasure, and that is the key to you being you. Or the immaterial. And that is the key to you being you. And these were the philosophies. And Paul is writing to this church that they are on guard that they don't be taken captive by this. Now, think about this expression, you be you. What does it represent in our moment? It represents radical individual expression or sometimes called radical, expressive individualism. Don't be pushed by convention. Don't be defined by rules and structures. Uh, we'll talk about this in a little minute, uh, in a bit when we get to the panel. Don't even be confined by your biologically assigned gender. You pursue your personal identity. And then be expressive about it. Loud and proud of the identity that you have found for yourself. This is very much part of the, the culture that surrounds you. How did Apple get so successful at selling us things that cost ridiculous amounts of money and we just constantly want more of them. Because it was the 
iPod, and then the iPad, and now it's the iPhone. And what I love about my students is as I look out across the classroom and I see their laptops, I know everything I need to know about them. I know what their favorite coffee shop is. I know what their favorite hobby is. I know what their favorite place to visit is. And for people at Reformation Bible College, I know what their favorite reformer is by the silhouette of their beard. But your identity is as individual as the stickers on your laptop or the stickers on your water bottle. And we are surrounded by this culture that tells you that you are free to pursue your own identity. And in the pursuit of that, you will find fulfillment and happiness. Well, notice what Paul does, though, in these verses. He turns it and he says, and not according to Christ. So here's what you have to avoid. And, and make no mistake about it, it's out to get you. It's out to, to capture you. And here's what you pursue in the opposite. Christ. And notice what Paul goes on to say about Christ. In verse 9 he says, For in Him, so now we're going to find out who Christ is, in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That is, in a single sentence, a summation of pages of biblical material of who Jesus is. He is truly God and truly human in one person. The whole fullness of deity, all that is deity, that which is at the essence of the divine nature, is in Him. And it dwells bodily. Now, you see what he's doing. In his moment, he's cutting against that worldview that says the body doesn't matter, it's all an illusion, it's just the immaterial. No, the incarnation shows that God created us as physical beings. And Jesus took on flesh. That's what incarnate actually means. Carne, flesh. And He's of the essence of the divine nature. And as the God-man, he is unique in all of history. And as the God-man, we are to look to him, and it is in him that we actually find our identity. <clears throat> Paul goes on to say, and you have been filled in him. There's a, another English translation that puts it, I think, in a, in a way that I just appreciate a little bit more. It says, and you are complete in Him. Looking for fulfillment, looking to find yourself, looking to find your place in this world, do you know where you're going to find it? In Christ. And then let's say one more thing about this. If you are in Christ... If you are in Him, you have all you will ever need. In Christ, you have all you will ever need. Because in Him, you are complete. Now, let's think through this. Eric used the chalkboard. I really want to use the chalkboard. When we are in Adam, because what, what Paul's getting at here is our identity. And when we are in Adam, we are many things, but one of the things is we are incomplete. And so, as incomplete, what do we do? We seek. 
We go to this thing to find fulfillment, and we go to this thing to find fulfillment, and we look to this philosophy, and we look to this worldview, and we look to this form of entertainment because we're not quite right. We're not quite what God created us to be. Uh, We were in the image of God. We were in fellowship with God. We had fulfillment and contentment in Him. And then that other shoe dropped. And Adam sinned. And when he sinned, he plunged all of us into sin with him. And now in Adam, that image of God that is in us is fractured. And that fellowship with God is broken. And we are not in a right relationship with God. Instead, we are aliens and strangers, and we are not at home in Eden. We're kicked out of the garden. And to impress upon us the point, what does God do? But he puts two angels there, and this is far more exciting than anything in a Tolkien novel. He's got them with swords spinning and lights flashing. There's no way we're going back there in our current state in Adam. And so we go from this thing to this thing to this thing, and we are captive by philosophies and empty deceits, shallow promise, but hollow when you get into it, deceits, human traditions, basic principles of the world. And so what is Paul putting alongside of this? In Christ. And what are we in Christ? Complete. Because as the God man, Christ, who lived his sinless, perfect life, remember what what, uh, Nathan Bingham said when he was talking about the final telegraph? And you're all thinking, "What what is a telegraph of Machen or telegram of Machen? So thankful. For the active obedience of Christ, no hope without it. See, Christ not only undid what Adam did, which was disobey and plunge us all into sin, Christ not only undid that through what we call his passive obedience, of his enduring the punishment and the penalty for sin, which is ultimately there in the cross as the cup of God's wrath intended for us is poured out on him. But do you know what else Adam, or what Christ does for us? Is he does what Adam did not do. He undoes what Adam did, and he does what Adam did not do by keeping the law and perfect obedience. And so now, in Christ, we are restored in every way, but in that ultimate way of restored in our relationship to God. And here's the word. Rest. Trust. To be at peace. The, the seeker's not at peace. They're wandering. Have you seen, are, are, you, are you as big of a fan of shark documentaries as I am? <clears throat> and what are, they, what are sharks doing? The big ones. They're always doing this. Because they're restless. Because they always need food. They always need blood. They always need more. And they're just always restless, always on the move, migrating, trying to find this group of swimmers off of New Smyrna Beach, or trying to find this surfer off of New Smyrna Beach, or trying to find this person on a floaty off New Smyrna Beach. You get the impression. And so they're restless. And they're just going from thing to thing to thing to thing, and not fulfilled. But if we are complete in Christ, do you know what we have in Christ? Is peace. Now, it doesn't mean everything in our life is great. It, it, you were talking about it exactly. It does, sometimes after salvation, things get worse from one standpoint. But we can be at peace because the ultimate issue in our lives has now been resolved. 
the ultimate issue of separation from God has now been resolved. Uh, what we're seeing here in Colossians chapter 2 is a biblical answer to that question, who am I? And the world in which you live wants to say the answer to that is, go on your journey, discover yourself, and then be you. And I want to tell you, it's a human tradition. It's an empty deceit. And it's a captivating philosophy. And the good news is, there's Christ. And your identity is in Christ. So I'll say it again. If you have Christ, and if you are in Christ, you are complete and you have all you will ever need. Thank you, Dr. Nichols, for the encouraging reminder of the blessing that it is to be in Christ. Well, there is little doubt that some of the most prominent and relevant issues that we face today are issues pertaining to gender and sexuality. I'm sure at one point or another, we have found ourselves interacting with somebody who is struggling or curious about things of this nature. So we have our speakers today to address, to address these very issues and to consider these things and to consider what does the Bible teach and how should Christians think about matters of gender and sexuality. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nichols, Reverend Bancroft, and Mr. Nathan W. Bigham. Well, as Stephen said, we're here to talk about gender and sexuality. Why is it that we're discussing that today? What's the, what's the real reason why this is even on a schedule something that we should be discussing? Yeah, I think the question that gets posed to us as Christians is why do we keep talking about this as if we're somehow reacting negatively or somehow unloving? I, I think it should be clear that Christians are interested in this topic and any other topic, not because we're sort of chasing uh, wherever we are offended or wherever uh, some tradition is being uprooted. It's because we genuinely care about people and genuinely believe God has communicated clearly. And our desire is for people to know not what we think, but what God has said. So our desire is to help people. I'm, I'm struck by Romans chapter 1 and verse 21 where Paul says here, kind of making a commentary about society, uh, he says in verse 21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened Claiming to be wise, they became fools. What we're not saying is that we are wise and others are foolish. What we're saying is God's word, God is wise, spoken to us in his word, and we want to offer clarity out of genuine concern and care for people in the same way that we would want other people to do with us as an expression of love. You know, I, we're going to get into this, but what's interesting to me about this discussion of gender and sexuality is, this is, this is before we get out of the pages of Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. And so, and, and when you think about it, this of course is biblical teaching, Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, but it's also a biblical record of what we would call the natural order, or sometimes we have this expression of natural law, but it's, it's, a, it's a biblical recording of what is really universal law or, or how, how the world is to function. 
And what we see in those opening chapters is gender, uh, male and female, he created them. And then we also see in those opening chapters a uh, heterosexual relationship, that the male and female are to come together in marriage. So it's very interesting to me that this, this discussion, which has become very loud in the last just even seven, eight, nine years um, of gender and sexuality, is aimed really at the very foundations of the world God made and the world, uh, the function of the world as God intended it. And as we've taken these conferences across the country, we typically have a time of Q&A with you and as we'll, we'll have at the end of, of today as well. The hot seat. I the like. hot seat, that's right. And increasingly, more and more, the young people in attendance are asking you questions about their sexuality, gender identity, and things like that. So I am thankful that we have an opportunity to be able to just dig a little bit deeper into this topic. I think it is helpful at the outset to, to begin by being clear, as you, you mentioned, Eric, what is it that we believe the Bible teaches when it comes to gender and sexuality? You've touched on a little bit already, Dr. Nichols, but what do we believe as Christians in these areas? I can start, and Dr. Nichols, you uh, fill in here. I think kind of going back, kind of just again, framing the foundation, we see in Genesis, there is a God. Uh, he is responsible for creation because he creates all things. Uh, he not only has create, he not only creates, he creates humanity. He not only creates humanity, he creates humanity male and female, distinct in his purposes. He creates male and female for each other as a complement to one another. He creates them in his image. They are image bearers of him who creates them. It's something unique about men and women, male and female, unlike any other aspect of creation. When he binds them together, when he brings them together in marriage, he's actually telling of a more profounder story than just their relationship to each other. He's actually telling a story about the relationship of Christ to the church. So the reason this is fundamentally important is because we learn from the very beginning, what does it mean to be a person? To be, to be created with a gender, with a particular purpose in God's mind. To tell a particular story. To interact with each other as a means of human flourishing in society versus, at worst, human destruction in society. And so what you have is you have basically an atheistic attempt to deconstruct the very personhood of man as if there is, one, no God, therefore no authority, and therefore no responsibility to anybody else other than yourself. Uh, friend, that is not liberating, that's damning. That is a curse to people, which in just proliferating that in society and in systems just puts people more back at a societal level of what they are to a person, which is futile in their mind and darkened in their hearts. And that's completely contrary to what Scripture says. There's a <clears throat> phrase from a German theologian that I've always found helpful. It says... Probably the, probably the same one that I was going to cite, the same German theologian. Let's see if that's what you're going to do I with. saw it in your notes, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, No, it, so he's saying it's not a fallen world. It's a fallen, falling world. And I, I think that's very helpful for us because these things are rarely static. Like as ideas are introduced, they rarely are static. They tend to, to devolve pretty quickly. And so if you look back over the past couple years when this sort of radical transgender conversation started happening, we've, we've moved pretty quickly in the past couple of years. Even to where you've probably heard this expression, post-binary. So the, the issue is not even choosing maleness or femaleness, and there's, you know, this dis gender is differentiated from sex. So whatever your, whatever your biologically assigned sex is, you choose your gender. But what's the next step? And the next step is, let's just do away with categories altogether. Uh, Post-binary. And, you know, you go back to the created order, and, and that's what it is. It's a created order. 
there's a distinction. There's a distinction between the divine being and all being. And then there's a distinction between the divine being and angelic being. being. And then there's this, this world of animals and birds in the air. And then all of a sudden you come to this moment where human beings are special in their creation. It's like the whole creation account, just the brakes are put on. And, and we have this intimate account of God, as it were, uh, anthropomorphically reaching up and grabbing a handful of dust and breathing. This is very intimate. It's very different. Everything else is God speaks and it is. God speaks and it is. But there's this intimate moment as God creates human beings. And that's that, what, what is that? But structure and order in the universe. And then within human beings, there's maleness and femaleness. So here's what we're not saying. We will deny this. Gender is not a social construct. Uh, you need to hear that. A gender is not something that's just created by societies. It is woven into the very fabric of the natural order of things, gender. And it is part of God's order of creation. And so what we see is a push against that. And it's not going to end well. And it's not going to promise fulfillment for someone who pursues that. It's going to ultimately sort of boomerang back with a lot of sorrow and pain. You know, you can go to a buffet and uh, you can eat all you want and you can be so happy. Um, but it's going to boomerang into a little pain as you have to waddle out of the buffet. And, and in one sense, all of sin is like that. It sort of entices fulfillment and pleasure, but because it is contrary to what God created us for, it really reaps and harvests pain. And so one of the reasons we're talking about this with you is people are telling you it's okay to do this. And, and gender reassignment surgery at, you know, elementary school ages. Um, it's just a world of hurt is going to come back on that. And so that's why we're talking about these things. And we have to be very clear, I think, of this as Christians. This is in the Bible, but this is the natural order of things. And Romans 1, that you quoted from, explains what happens when we go against the natural order of things. It devolves into a downward uh, spiral. And the rates of suicide, depression, those that are following uh, transgender movement in the LGBTQ movement are so high, and it's so sad, but they're promised almost a false gospel. They're told all of the angst and confusion, and you just don't feel comfortable in your own body, all of the challenges and restlessness, as you were referring to in your last session, all of that restlessness will just go away if you just have surgery done to change your body. And they wake up from that surgery, they go through that healing process, and they still have the same restlessness. They're still estranged from their creator. They still have sin and shame, and it did not deliver what was promised to them. And so for many in that community, the only answer is suicide, which is heartbreaking and, and so sad. Um, what is at risk? What is at risk if we get this wrong? Those that are saying, hey, I know your book says this about gender and sexuality, but what's the big deal? Let people live how they want to live. Um, we've moved on from your ideals. What really is at risk in the community, in the church, if we get these truths wrong? I mean, I think there's a number of things that we run the risk with. First of all, you're basically talking about a new version, a new um, view of salvation. What is my problem and what is the solution? And today, the, the gospel of society is that the good news is self-fulfillment. And I need to find that fulfillment largely defined by my desires. 
and if I pursue those desires to the fullness of what's afforded me the opportunity, be it gender reassignment surgery or following out the sexual desires of my heart or whatever that might be, I'm recasting a new vision of my identity and what will provide for me security and assurance and hope and peace. And what ends up happening as to what's at risk is what's always at risk. An alternative way to try to live in God's world by one, denying his world that he exists, or two, denying his word that he has spoken and the offer that he extends himself. Jesus in Matthew 11 says, come to me all you heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest. Jesus acknowledges burdens. He acknowledges heavy laden, the the difficulties. And you don't have to be that old to already begin to experience that, to feel that. Perhaps some of the homes you've come from, perhaps some of the desires internally you have that you know as I sit here and speak to you, you have, but you've not shared with anybody else here. But Jesus knows that and cares about you in that condition, and he offers you hope. But the problem is, when we present an alternative view of salvation in light of an alternative problem, you basically condemn people to their own sins. You leave them to some alternative version of how they can find peace, how they can find redemption, how they can find rescue. But it just enslaves them to more dark deeds, and they're just simply trying to facilitate friendships that, that only support their damaging decisions. So it, it really corrupts the person's idea of hope. It really distorts what is God's offer of hope when Jesus says, I will give you rest. The problem today is when we try to find our identity in anything other than what you said there, in Christ, we will not find rest. And what the world is offering us today, be it gender confusion or otherwise, is we're constantly seeking, be it hormonal, be it medical, be it relational, be it possessive, we're constantly seeking rest in no other place that will be found than in Christ himself. I do want to get practical, and I know we don't have a lot of time this afternoon. And so practically speaking, what counsel would you give to someone? They're watching online, they're here this afternoon, and they would have said and, and say, I'm, I'm a Christian, but in recent weeks, months perhaps, they've begun to think, you know, maybe I am attracted to someone of the, of the same sex. How would you counsel them? I would say, first of all, remember this. Desire is not your destiny. Desire is not your destiny. Today, you're often taught, if you feel it profoundly enough, repeatedly enough, that must be the true you. When the reality is, any number of us, and at some extent, all of us, have conflicting desires. And those desires do not define you. Where you wanna provide clarity is in the reality. What does God's word say? Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. So I wanna just say to be very clear, Christians do not believe in the gospel, the good news of heterosexuality. We believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. So there can be somebody who does not struggle with same-sex attraction, but they struggle with opposite-sex attraction. The lusts of their flesh are still corrupted in that they pursue that in their imagination or in action by the lust of their hearts in any number of ways. So if you are somebody who struggles with this in one area, do not think you're the only person who's struggling as the scripture says there, and it goes on to say, and God is faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able, and he'll provide a way of escape. Well, part of that reality is in the hope of community. One of the things I would encourage you, depending on the environment you're in, is to, to take that brave step and speak to your mom or your dad, to speak to your pastor, speak to one of your God leaders and say, hey, I'm just gonna put myself out there these are these desires I have, and I don't know what to make of them. And I'm afraid to share this with you because I'm afraid of what you might think of me, but I need help. I'm struggling privately. Friend, by taking that step, 
you are in humility saying, I believe God, which is God does not want me to do this in privacy, but in the community of other people who care for me. And if you have a Christian mom or dad, that's definitely gonna be true of them. If you have, I hope you do, Christian pastors, you have pastors, it's really true for them. And then other godly leaders as well, they wanna help walk through this with you so that you don't think you just have to sort of suffer in silence and maybe just sort of surrender to these desires to determine the future identity that you take on. I think that's brilliant and very helpful. F finding help through trusted and, and wise and godly counsel. Also appreciate you're talking about sexual purity, not just in terms of the same-sex desires, but a reminder for all of us of this God-given gift of sexuality, which there's all sorts of perversions of it that are, are presented to us. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to think a little bit this way, I think there's an overwhelming pressure to think that because this is such an outdated book and because life in the 21st century has so many components to it that the Bible just never even envisioned, that different rules apply to us today in the 21st century than Christians in the past. So we can be faithful Christians today but following the lead of culture on some of these things, whether it's more of an acceptance of transgenderism or an acceptance of same-sex issues, that is a very mistaken path to go on. Uh, this is no longer uh, irrelevant because we are now in the 21st century and sociologists tell us more about ourselves that are actually true as human beings than what the Bible says. So we can set this aside because of where we live in the 21st century. I'd encourage you to be very careful not to, to not give in to that and instead to not sort of go along with some of these cultural sensibilities on this, but to say, I do need to submit to Scripture here, and I do need to look to Scripture here uh, to guide me. On, on these issues and on these challenges I face. Just to end on this question, Romans 1 seems to suggest that homosexuality is a more heinous sin because it goes against nature, and we've brought that up already today. Is there hope for forgiveness and freedom from any of these sexual sins? I'm encouraged by what Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 11, and such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Two things I wanna observe there. Number one, God is interested in more than just sexual sins. All sin is an act of holy treason against a holy God. All of it's worthy of his righteous condemnation and wrath. From, from slander to sexuality, Second highlight I wanna point out here is the, the church biographically is filled with such people, that being their history of what God has saved them from. So if there's anybody here who thinks, you don't know what I've done, you don't know what I'm tempted to do, there's no way when you speak of the good news of Jesus saving sinners that he would mean that for me, I would say, oh, welcome to the family. You're amongst the people who can all identify with these. While our sins might differ in detail, all of us find hope in the same Savior. And so I'm just encouraged to be reminded that seemingly our quote unquote forefathers in the faith, the early church, from the very beginning, has a testimony of all kinds of people saved out of all kinds of backgrounds. That does not mean we were saved and promised that we would never sin again just meant we were saved from the consequence of that sin, from the power of that sin, though we still fought against the presence of it, but by the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us, we had the ability by God's grace to say no to it and pursue what our hearts desired, 
which was to walk in holiness. And so we see that in the church here. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Would you join me in thanking Pastor Bancroft and Dr. Nichols? And to those joining us online, I do want to thank you for being with us today. This does come to the end of the live stream today. At Ligonier Ministries, our heart is to serve you, and we have many free discipleship resources to help you. So I would encourage you, if you have not downloaded it already, to download the free Ligonier Ministries app. If you do download that in the next couple of weeks, there will be a new Ligonier app waiting for you. So I encourage you to get that so that you receive that as soon as it is available. We do hope that we'll see you at an upcoming Ligonier conference soon.